Hello and welcome to topic six where we're going to be learning about the freedom of speech and in this lecture you're going to be learning about the foundations of freedom of speech. So at the top there you see the First Amendment. Uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech and the chapter that you're going to be reading about freedom of speech is dedicated to um, talking about how the Supreme Court has interpreted that um, part of the First Amendment. And so when we talk about freedom of speech, what are we talking about? Well, freedom of speech is the, the right to communicate ideas and information without fear of government censorship. So it's the liberty that you have to express yourself without feeling like you're going to get some sort of punishment or retaliation from, from the government for what you said. Um, freedom of speech, um, uh, when you're talking about that communication of ideas, you know, we're oftentimes talking about communicating ideas related to political values. Um, it could be that you are talking about a particular political ideology like communism or conservatism. Uh, you might be communicating about a particular social issue. Um, you might want to communicate ideas in favor or, or against abortion, in favor or against the right to bear arms. Um, and, and, you know, more generally, it could just have to do with um, a communicating about social values, what you might think is moral or immoral, what you think is right behavior or wrong behavior, whatever. Um, and so when you're talking about communicating ideas, it's the, the way that humans are trying to communicate to others about what their beliefs and values are. Um, now, keep in mind that in, when you're reading in the textbook, you're going to be reading about this thing called true speech. A lot of times the Supreme Court will ask, is this utterance true speech and when they say that they're not talking about true speech as being that the the claims that the speech is making are are true or false rather they're saying is this um true speech in terms of trying to communicate an idea whether that's political social or otherwise so keep that in mind as we're moving forward now keep in mind that um uh as you're defined during the course of this chapter that the Supreme Court includes um, unpopular and offensive ideas in the notion of what constitutes uh, speech. And so you're going to be reading a, a couple of cases about um, hateful speech. And, you know, a very legitimate question arises that when your speech is communicating a, a hateful or harmful idea to other groups, uh, particularly to minority groups, is that speech that should be protected? The Supreme Court says, yes, it is. And when we get back from spring break, we'll be learning more about the argument that the Supreme Court makes in favor of protecting hateful and offensive speech. Now, as you'll be reading in the textbook, the Supreme Court has never given a literal interpretation of the First Amendment. They have never um, uh, uh, said that speech is means like, actual words that come out of your mouth and that that's the only thing that is protected by the First Amendment. The Supreme Court, that is not the way they interpret um, the First Amendment. And so when you're talking about freedom of speech, we're not just talking about utterances that come out of your mouth. Um, we're talking about all forms of communication. And so we're talking about books, um, uh, visual communication through art, uh, telecom and film, pamphlets, posters, campaign speeches, etc. Now, the way the court um, approaches those different utterances might be a little bit different. And so late, uh, when we get back from spring break, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, expressive conduct within a school environment. And so the way they can uh, uh, approach uh, speech may be different. They may treat uh, commercial speech or tele, uh, you know, films differently than utterances from the mouth. Um, but that these, as listed there, these are all types of communication uh, or uh, speech that is uh, potentially protected by the First Amendment. Now, keep in mind that speech also, the Supreme Court says that um, speech also includes action or conduct that communicates ideas. And we'll be talking about that in this, um, in topic six, where we look at uh, two cases that deal with the symbolic speech. And so symbolic speech is where you're, you're taking an action and your action is supposed to communicate something. And so a sit-in is, is, is considered speech. You may not be talking, but you're sitting there trying to make a point, waving a flag, burning a flag, wearing an armband, wearing buttons. All of those are considered 
speech in terms of the way that the Supreme Court broadly identifies speech. We're going to be looking at two cases in topic six, United States v. O'Brien, which is about whether or not burning your draft card during the Vietnam War is protected speech. We're also going to be looking at the landmark case. Both of these are landmark cases, Texas v. Johnson, which is the flag burning case. But both of those are cases that deal with symbolic speech. So why does the court protect nearly all types of speech, even offensive speech? I mean, as you're going to find in this chapter, the court, um, particularly the standard that we use today, it's very difficult to uh, curtail for the government to curtail a person's freedom of speech. Why is it? Why have they, um, the court offered such an expansive and robust protection of freedom of speech? Well, as it says there at the top that, you know, freedom of speech is sort of seen as the cornerstone of the of a democratic society. And this um, uh, idea that freedom of speech is essential to a democratic society really stems forth or comes forth from James Madison. You know, the idea is, is that, um, you know, democracy is majority rule and that the will of the majority then gets translated into who's going to get elected. And then in theory, um, the types of policies that are enacted are a reflection of the majority will. Well, if the government can tamp down or um, censor the speech of some people, then we really do not know what the will of the majority is. So as it says there, you can't have true majority rule if some voices are suppressed, in particular minority voices, right? Those voices that are outside of the mainstream. Um, because you really, um, you don't hear from everybody in the democratic society. And therefore, um, since some people cannot participate in terms of the exchange of ideas, um, then while there might be a majority of people that elect somebody, um, that, that exercising a majority will is, um, uh, vacant of the voice of those who are not in the majority. And who knows, maybe if those minority points of view were allowed to be um, broadcast, then those who's aligned with the majority might leave and go with the majority minority point of view, thus creating a new majority. So bottom line is, is you can't have a majority rules kind of government unless all voices are heard. Another perspective, and this is a perspective that comes from John Stuart Mill, is um, that freedom of speech is um, necessary for the pursuit of truth. Uh, in other words, that you need to have an opportunity to challenge and confront all ideas. And so it's sort of this no idea of a marketplace of ideas, right? That if you have liberty, if you have the freedom to express yourself, then all ideas get to compete against each other. And so if an idea, even if it like it seems completely untrue, um, if that idea is allowed to compete against other ideas, it's challenged um, and that we get to discover whether or not the idea that's being promoted is a, a, a true and worthy idea. Or, I mean, you think about Galileo, right? And, and it, it, the promotion of his understanding of that the earth doesn't revolve around the, uh, or that the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, but that the earth revolves around the sun. Well, um, when he argued that the earth and other planets revolve around the sun, I mean, that was seen as like complete and utter heresy, right? And that viewpoint was um, censored. Well, if that viewpoint had continued to be censored, the truth of the, um, uh, the uh, planets revolving in the, uh, around the sun never would have been discovered. Uh, furthermore, that if an idea is not true, or if it's an, a, a bad idea or a harmful idea, um, that people then in the marketplace of ideas, you can challenge these other ideas and that you can out them um, for their falsehoods. You can out them for the untrue statements that they are uh, promoting. Um, that because there's, you can, those ideas, all ideas are out there for competition, that is a way that um, that basically ideas that are either harmful or untrue um, can be exposed as such. Now, um, we're going to be talking about this in our after spring break in our discussion on disinformation 
disinformation and conspiracy theory, right? I think when we think about the marketplace of ideas, we think that all ideas are sort of on level playing field, right? Like you can all stand in the town square and promote your viewpoints, or you can, you know, um, you know, be on the radio and promote, promote your viewpoints. I mean, ideas are never going to be equally promoted because of technology, but there's something about like Twitter and Facebook and the technology that we have today that really one provides a tremendous amplifier for disinformation and conspiracy theories in a way that um, was not possible prior to the creation of that technology. And also, as we all know, we get into our silos uh, when it comes to information technology. And so that there's really um, difficulty. There's a, It's difficult to have a marketplace of ideas when everybody just goes down in their rabbit hole and stays there and, you know, consumes information that reinforces what they um, uh, believe to be true. So we're going to be talking about that uh, as it relates to these reasons for why freedom of expression is so fundamental to a democratic society. Are there limitations to that perspective? And then um, finally, the idea that um, freedom of expression is fundamental to um, to being human, um, that you have beliefs, you want to be able to communicate your beliefs, um, and that everybody should have the right to um, to do that because what we believe is important to what it means to be a human and freedom of expression gives us the the avenue to express our our human values and beliefs but do keep in mind that what are the potential harms of protecting offensive speech so um communicating what is in your conscience is a good thing but what if what's in your conscience is is really hateful to another group should there be limitations on that and we'll explore that more detail in more detail after spring break there are limits on freedom of speech speech can and is regulated just as we saw that uh, religious practice is regulated and as we're going to see moving over your right to bear arms can be limited your right to exercise your privacy is limited right um our liberty liberties aren't nor they should be absolute and that that is the case with speech now before we talk about the way speech is regulated i want to just make a note as related to something we were talking about on the last slide we were talking about twitter and facebook note that the bill of rights and the first amendment specifically that we're talking about here it applies to the actions of government actors not to private actors okay so keep in mind the bill of rights says congress congress and then because of incorporation state and local governments cannot do these things okay it is placing a restriction a prohibition on government actors not on private actors so when it comes to the first amendment the First Amendment does not apply to the actions of Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. Those are privately owned corporations. Um, when you get a Facebook account or you get a Twitter account, there are um, rules that you have to abide by. And if you don't abide by those rules, then you can get kicked off of the platform and people do get kicked off of the platform. Probably the most famous instance of that is uh, the former president of the United States being deplatformed from Twitter for life. I think for life for Facebook as well. And boy, if any of you are on Twitter or Facebook, it's really changed the landscape of Twitter and, and, and Facebook with um, the, the uh, with the silencing of, of Donald Trump on those platforms. Um, but if Twitter wants to ban posts, you say hey, you can't post pictures of um, standard poodles, who would ever do that? But uh, Twitter could say, uh, according to our, you know, the user's agreement here, you can't post pictures of standard poodles. And if you do, then you're kicked off of Twitter. They can do that. The First Amendment doesn't apply to Twitter and Facebook. Although I think we're going to see in, 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 in speech jurisprudence that, you know, it's sort of like, is Twitter really a totally private realm? It's a privately owned corporation, but it really does serve as not just this national, but this international forum for the exchange of ideas. So it's a really interesting um, area of study moving forward in freedom of speech. But I just wanted to, to remind you, the First Amendment does not apply to the actions of private actors, only the public actors. Okay, so what type of speech falls outside of First Amendment protections? So some types of speech are not protected by the First Amendment. What types? Why not protected? Well, if the purpose of the speech is to harm, bring about violence, appeal to purient interests, um, they're not considered speech by the court, okay? 
So utterances that where the only purpose is to harm somebody, the only purpose is to bring about an imminent danger or violence. The only purpose is to appeal to purian and purian means like unwholesome or unnatural sexual desires. So sort of like um, uh, pornography or obscenity. Um, if the only purpose of speech is to do those things, then it's, it's not considered speech by the court and it falls outside of First Amendment protections. Um, and so let's look at uh, some examples or categories of uh, speech that falls outside of First Amendment protections. Okay, so what are some examples of unprotected speech? Speech that falls outside of First Amendment protection. Threats, intimidation, and fighting words. This would be expressions of criminal intent. And so if you are conspiring to commit a crime, that's not protected by the First Amendment. Um, if uh, a criminal, any sort of insults or epitaph, where the insults and the epitaphs are the only aspect of the speech that you are making, that it's not an insult that's wrapped up into like a communication of ideas, okay? If it's just like you're like, F you, you effing cops, right? That's not protected speech. That is considered um, uh, fighting words. You're going to be reading two uh, cases, Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire and Cohen versus California that goes into detail in this part of the chapter about what constitutes uh, fighting words. Uh, incitement or clear and present danger. And so any speech that... Um, uh, that uh, will lead to violence, okay, uh, is not protected by the First Amendment. And so in our next lecture for t this uh, topic six, we're going to look at the development of the standard and, uh, you know, uh, in terms of what kind of speech is protected. And it starts with the clear and present danger test in the Schneck case, which you're going to be learning about. And it ends with the Brandenburg versus Ohio case. And so as you're going to see in the next, uh, in our next slides, that um, protection of speech started really high and then it went down and then it went back up. And so it, if the, your speech is, bring, is likely and will bring about imminent um, lawless behavior, that's not protected, but it's a really high standard. And we even sort of saw that playing out in terms of the insurrection at the Capitol. Was it actually incitement? Because criminal incitement is, is not protected speech and you can be, you can be um, uh, charged with inciting violence. Harassment, extreme and repetitive uh, offensive conduct. And so um, if you're in a workplace or anywhere walking down the street and somebody's just continually harassing you, that's not protected speech. Uh, obscenity is not a protected speech, uh, and that would be uh, uh, depictions of sexual content that are patently offensive um, and that there's no other merit to the depiction, right? So if it's a book and it has some patently offensive things, but it's really a work of literature or it's a scientific manual, manual and some of the images are like offensive, right? That wouldn't be considered um, uh, obscenity. There's a whole chapter in your textbook about obscenity and pornography, so we're not going to do it. Um, but if you want to learn more about it, take a look at it. And then uh, finally, libel and slander. And so libel is writ. Uh, so let me just put it up there. Um, libel and slander is that it's intentionally lying in order to harm someone. Okay. Uh, libel is when you are intentionally lying in print, and slander is when you're intentionally lying. Um, uh, orally, verbally, okay? That falls outside of First Amendment protections as well. So that just gives you an idea of what the courts have said fall outside of First Amendment protections. Okay, um, so all other speech and expressive conduct is protected by the First Amendment. So if it's not inciting violence, if it's not considered obscene, if it's not considered fighting words, etc., it's protected by the First Amendment. Um, now keep in mind that per a protected speech is not without regulations. So if you're communicating a political idea, it doesn't mean you can communicate your political idea in whatever manner, at whatever time, and at whatever place you want to. Um, that you'll be learning in the textbook that there are the government has the uh, the, the right to and the duty to place time, manner, place restrictions on protected speech. 
And so they might say that you need to have a permit in order to have your protest at a park. Uh, they might say that there's a particular manner in which you have to engage in that speech act, um, that you can't um, be blaring it through loudspeakers that are, you know, uh, disturbing the peace of the people that live near the park. Um, there's a certain place restrictions. You can have your protest in a park, but you can't have your protest on I-43, right, as we see, have seen with some recent protests. So all of those are legitimate time, play, manner, place restrictions that can be placed on protected speech. Um, uh, that being the case that you'll be reading in the textbook about how these restrictions need to be viewpoint um, neutral. They can't target a particular viewpoint with restrictions. So, for example, you can't say, well, uh, conservatives must have a permit to be in the park and they can only be there from, you know, 10 in the morning till two in the afternoon. But liberals don't need a permit and they can protest wherever they want at whatever time, right? That would be an unconstitutional time, manner, place restriction because it is not treating all viewpoints um, the same. It's targeting one viewpoint for those restrictions. And another thing you'll be learning about in your textbook are the forums. And so um, that some forums are like public forums, like the um, like a public park, and that those are usually seen as these traditional places where people can go and do a lot of things. But one of the things they can do is to um, communicate themselves. You know, they can express themselves. But there are other forums that um, where the government purpose is much greater. Uh, so like a polling place, for example, uh, that people go to a polling place to vote. Well, um, that because the government interest is heightened, making sure that people can get to and from the polls in an unharassed manner, that they can place restrictions on that forum because it's not a traditional public forum. It's a forum that has a particular purpose that is to go and vote. So keep that in mind as you're learning about restrictions that are placed on protected speech. Okay, that's it for this um, lecture. The next lecture, we'll be taking a look at the standards that the court has used in developing um, the tests that they're gonna use when it comes to deciding whether or not speech is protected. So it's similar to religious freedoms that the court creates standards or tests to determine whether speech is protected. And what, you're gonna, what we're gonna learn in the next lecture is that um, Today we get a lot, uh, very high protections on so-called true speech, on speech that's communicating ideas or values. Um, but historically, speech has not always received such high protection as it does today. And we'll look at the change over time. Um, and, that, and, and you're gonna find that the standard has changed significantly over time. Okay, thanks for paying attention and I will talk to you again soon, bye.